session one of four that will be presented today. We kick it off with uh, part one, Zoe Hot Topics Installation and Administration. I am Rose Sikatch. I am the Zoe Onboarding Squad Lead. And what that means to all of you is I try to help folks, we, the onboarding squad, we try to help folks get started with Zoe on, on many levels. Whether you're a vendor who's looking to extend Zoe, or you're new to Zoe, or a new user, and you're interested in something technical or non-technical related to Zoe, this squad helps put you in touch with the right folks and get you going with, with all things Zoe. So certainly, please feel free to pull me aside in the hall, reach out to me if, if I can be of any assistance whatsoever. I can almost promise you I'll get you in touch with the right folks to get you going. Before we get started, I wanted to make you all aware that we have a raffle going on throughout um, all of today, and on Wednesday we'll have a roadmap session, whereby if you just fill out this little ticket that I'll come around and hand to you, you can put your name in the hat for a raffle. We're giving away 50 uh, Zoe Yeti mugs, and each time you put in a ticket, obviously it increases your chances. So attend more Zoe sessions and we can almost guarantee you'll walk away with a Yeti mug. And I think with that, that's all I wanted to say. I will turn it over to Sean. Okay. Yep. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Sean Grady. I've been with Zoe since the very beginning, and uh, today we're going to talk to you about installation and administration topics. This is sort of near and dear to my heart because uh, I've worked with a lot of users over the five years that we've had Zoe, and um, you know we we started off with very simple requirements, and uh, things ramped up uh, between then and now as we got more success and more users. So we've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't, and I wanted to share with you the latest and greatest of installing it in and some tips, and then. Of course, Joe Winchester and Jan are, are with us as well, and they're going to take the second and third parts of this discussion where we deep dive into sort of what's next and also security and certificates because that tends to be a hot topic. So what I'm going to start with first is just a look at the as-is state of Zoe version 2 installation and administration. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Zoe version 1 in this slide. Probably not today uh, very much at all, just because um, version one is towards the end of its life cycle. Every, every two years, we're slated to be releasing a new version of Zoe, and during that time, that's when we can evaluate uh, is what we're doing right or wrong, and how can we shift? And so, in version two, we shifted to this model that we see here, in which we call uh, the ZWE command line utility and the YAML configuration file. And the idea with this is that you have, for the most part, one configuration file. You can, you can split it into subsections, which I'll talk about soon, but it's really just one configuration file for all of Zoe and its extensions. And there is a command line tool called ZWE that consumes that YAML and it uh, will do various management operations for you. So, you know, you can install Zoe using JCLs, you can start it up using your favorite tool like SPSF, etc. But if you're on the Unix command line, ZWE is the tool that you can use to do a lot of these things anyway. And the nice thing about ZWE is that um, it just unifies all the actions that you can do. Um, so if you wanted to install Zoe, there's a ZWE to initialize a new instance or install or upgrade extensions. Um, if you want to diagnose an error message that you see or collect support info, ZWE have all of these commands. And um, with each command, you can type in dash dash help and you'll get output about what you can do with that command, what its purpose is, what uh, messages it could potentially print out. So you really don't even need to go over to a website to read anything. So before I move on though, I did want to point out the YAML file a little bit more here. Um, this has been uh, sort of new to some users on the mainframe. YAML isn't a traditional text file for a mainframe environment, but um, because 
because Zoe has uh, a core and extensions, we need a hierarchical configuration file so that we can separate things and keep them neatly organized. So YAML is one such file format that helps us with that. The thing about it is that it is space sensitive with its hierarchy, so you need to be careful about how you're aligning your columns. Um, you also have comments in line with the, uh, with the hash sign, and you can see here is an example of when you go to set up Zoe, uh, there's, a, there's a step called ZWE install and ZWE init, and they both use this section of the Zoe YAML called um, Zoe dot setup dot data set. When we refer to sections of our YAML in our documentation, we normally use dot to mean incrementing the, um, the columns on the side there. So, so that's the core, is we have the YAML file and we have a command line tool to make use of it, although it can be used in other ways as well. So I did mention this really nice uh, command line utility has dash dash help commands. Turns out we run automation on that output and we put all that on our website too. So if you're not that um, if you're not that familiar with or, or comfortable with um, the Unix side of mainframe and someone tells you to run a command, we can just point you to the documentation on the website too, so it makes it easier to consume. So um, th that way things don't become out of date either. Now, one of the things that um, that were, uh, was becoming a pain point for people with the YAML, if I go back a few slides here, is that column sensitivity. If you put data set on the same column as setup, it would no longer be zoe.setup.dataset, it would then be zoe.dataset, it would no longer be inside of the setup object. So, because ISPF edit, for example, doesn't give you syntax highlighting for YAML, it is easy to make simple mistakes here and then uh, be left with something that Zoe can't and we took that to heart and uh, addressed that problem in Zoe version two. We have uh, config validation and it goes hand in hand with the documentation of it as well. So uh, the first place that you're gonna find all of these properties that, that you want to use to customize your Zoe configuration is right in the installation directory, the root directory of Zoe. There's this file that you'll find called example zoe.yaml. And the documentation will talk about that as a lot as well. It's basically uh, something that's close to where you want to go, but there's a few places in there that says uh, commonly customized, you know, things like which networking port do you want to use, or what do you want to nickname your instance? You're gonna to wanna to customize those things. But that's the first place that you'll look. Now, um, the problem with that example is it's just an example. So what if you were looking for um, parameters that aren't commonly customized, something that's very specific to your organization? Well, we came up with an answer for that, um, and that goes into the validation section as well. So if we look at the previous section here, components, gateway, enabled, true, uh, we assume that that's a Boolean that can be either true or false, but what guarantees that that is the case? It turns out that this thing uh, that we added to Zoe, uh, JSON schema files, does that for us. So whenever you see a YAML file in Zoe, there is always an accompanying schema file that explicitly details what parameters are valid for that configuration file and a little description about them. So um, on our website, we list, we list all of these JSON schema files and um, you can have a look at them if you want. Uh, here's, here's actually a whole grid of them. Um, there's one for the base of Zoe, there's one for the mediation layer, there's one for the app framework. There's even one for installing extensions. But basically, each of these will detail, like you see on the right-hand side here, the types of properties that are valid and how they're valid. For example, is there a minimum number or a maximum number for an integer? And that is uh, you know, very good for making sure that we don't leave anything undocumented, but we also have automation on top of these files. So whenever you go to start up Zoe, there, uh, Zoe will not start up until it guarantees 
that your YAML file is correct against the scheme. And if it's not, it's going to tell you what's wrong. So uh, here's an example of that. <coughs> very, very simple thing that you could do wrong in your Zoe YAML is what if you just made a typo? What if you switched two letters around? So when you're customizing certificates, which we'll talk more about later, um, if you type in, if you meant to type in PKCS12 type certificate, but instead you got the C and the K reversed, um, if you started up the servers and didn't do any validation, you might have very weird error messages. They might tell you things that aren't really the issue, in, you know, the issue is just a typo. But because in the latest versions of Zoe, we do validation about your config file before we start up Zoe, we can give you an upfront error saying, we're not going any further because we know that this config is wrong. So. On the left hand side here, you'll see that we have an enum saying, here are the types of certificates that can be valid for Zoe. There's a few different types of key rings and PKCS12. And because PCKS12 wasn't in that list, when you go to start up Zoe, it's going to very quickly tell you that um, there was no matching email value at Zoe certificate key store type. So then you go and you look up at the file that it referenced, and you drill down into that YAML and you say, oh, I made a typo. So this output on the screen here is a little bit old, actually. I, I sort of used this from a previous presentation. Uh, we are constantly making this output more insightful. I think these days it will actually tell you what value was wrong and what the possible values can be, so you don't need to do as much digging. Um, so imagine that this could say even more, but at its core, what it's telling you is that it knows that you've done something wrong, and so it's it's saving you from more time-consuming troubleshooting with your outro. Um, so that's a little bit about validation. There's a few slides where, where we'll return to that later, but it's very important for making uh, administration easier so that you can see what's valid and that you can troubleshoot very quickly. The next thing that I wanted to go into was uh, something about dividing this YAML so that it's more effective in your organization and also about using partners. So um, if you've seen this Zoe YAML before, you might have seen that it's like, I don't know, a 300 line long file that talks about everything. But when I say everything, I mean that it talks about certificates, it talks about ZOSMF, it talks about Java and Node, mm -hmm. and in your organization, the people who maintain those, the settings of them, or where they live, or what version they are, those could be different administrators, and so you wouldn't want them to be responsible for editing one file. And we did take that into account, uh, so I wanted to point that out here. It's in our documentation under this section called using the config manager because the config manager is what drives all of this. And there's a few slides about that as well. But the short story here is that whenever you see a config property, like in our JCL startup Zoe, there's a config equals line. You may see that saying, you know, slash home slash my user slash example Zoe.yaml. But you can swap that out or a syntax in which you have the word file or the word parmlib and then parentheses and the name of the file or data set that you're pointing at. And what happens is uh, you can have multiple such files. They all need to be matching the same schema that we talked about earlier, so they all need to be talking about Zoe. It can't be like your grocery list. It will just fail validation, but it's just uh, splitting that one big file into multiple smaller files. There's actually an example of it here. Uh, you can see on the left, imagine that's one big file. We're talking about certificates and Java and ZLSMF. But if those are different uh, people in your organization, why not split those into separate files? So in the case of certificates, you'd have parmlib that says Zoe certs maybe, and uh, that's just going to say zoe.certificates and not talk about job. Maybe that's a Zoe Lang instead. And maybe ZOSMF is its own thing too. So that way you can keep these separate and, it, and update them independently. And one method that you might even do 
with splitting up files is to have the default and customizations. So this is actually something that we want to move more towards in our own documentation is we're still gonna have this example Zoe file, but we may give you more defaults so that you don't need to type as much. So the idea here is that if you have a big list of files or parm libs, you know, some, some Java stuff, some CLS and up stuff, or even defaults and customizations that if two files talk about the same subject, the file on the left side of your list of files will override the properties from the files on the right. So if you want to change the port of one of your servers from whatever Zoe's default is to whatever makes sense in that instance, you can just talk about that one section without having to duplicate the entire file. You can just talk about the differences. And I would highly recommend using this so that it's easier to track what did you actually change in Zoe? Because the example zoe.yaml that we give you, we don't really want you to edit it in place because then you're gonna have issues if you wanna go back and figure out what you changed. So it's always better to copy these things out and to limit your changes to a separate file so that you can actually see what the difference was. Um, so all of these, all these things are, by the way, on our website, um, docs.zoe.org. So if you need to refer to this, you know, somewhere between this and the slides, you have all the info that you need. Um, in addition to just splitting up the YAMLs, the YAML files can also have a little bit of logic in there. So if you want to make your configuration file portable, if you want to have um, a Zoe instance on five different LPARs, and they're very similar LPARs, but there's a few differences like host name, for example, um, you know, you don't want to end up with something that's hard to maintain by needing to hand type everything all the time. So it turns out that in these YAML files, if you use the syntax dollar and then two curly brackets with a space after and before the opening and closing curly brackets, you can type a little bit of JavaScript logic in there. It's not Node.js, it's not a full-blown JavaScript engine. Um, you're not gonna be doing crazy things in there. It's just a little bit of logic. And what you can do with it is you can, um, you can reference one section of the YAML uh, from another section of the YAML. For example, in here, uh, we know that both the app server and ZSS both have role-based access control as a feature. And that requires you to set up a lot of um, rack up profiles. So by default, it's off until you turn it on after you've done all that stuff. So rather than needing to go into both config file places and, and type true twice, you can actually just set true in the app server and then you can have ZSS point to the app server's config. That's what we've done in the red. Um, similarly, uh, the other section that we've done here is um, the instance name of Zoe here defaults to the host name of your uh, LPAR. So when ZSS wanted to find the mediation layer in state play, uh, we just pointed to the instance host name so that we wouldn't need to type in the host name explicitly. This is probably my favorite template trick at the moment. Uh, it was just added in the latest release of Zoe. Um, templates now have MVS symbol resolution. So at Rocket, we wanted to set up one Zoe config for um, our entire sysplex, but we needed to vary the host name. So in this template, you'll see that we set ZOS and F host is pointing to ZOS.resolve symbol system. And so that's going to substitute it to whatever the name of that system is without you needing to type that in. Um, you can also see towards the bottom here that uh, sometimes in templates you can put conditionals, so you can have an if or an else in there. If you need to make sure that your config uh, works in the event that if one component is on or one component is off, because if you're doing high availability, you might want to vary the quantity of different components that you have. So there's a lot of complex things that you can do in there. Um, so we're about to move on to our next speaker, but I did just want to point out a few useful ZWE commands.
sense since we just talked about all that. First is validation. I mentioned that Zoe won't start up unless you pass config validation. It will do that on startup. But if you want to do that on your own terms before even getting to startup, you can type in this command, zwe config validate. It's just gonna run the validation and do nothing else. So it takes literally about a second to complete. <coughs> Super fast, you just get in, get out, and figure out whether or not your Zoe is ready to go. The second thing that I wanted to point out is if you're not that comfortable with YAML, but someone asks you, hey, what is the value of a property? Um, ZWE config get can be used to read the YAML for you. Um, it uses a JQ syntax, so there's dot separation and you can do things like print out an entire section. Um, what it prints out varies on what you ask it. It can be a single item like a true or a false if that's what you ask it, but if you ask it to print out an entire section, it's gonna format it in JSON like you see there, or if you say, show me all my ports, uh, which that's the way that you do it, it's just gonna print out as a list. So it varies, but it can be pretty powerful for giving you quick answers to things. Anyway, that's like the baseline of the latest and greatest of Zoe configuration, but we're gonna build cooler things on top of that. So I'm gonna hand it over to <coughs> who's gonna talk about that. Thank you, Sean. So let's talk about something new that we introduced in the, uh, in the last release. It's still in progress and very fresh. Uh, I would like to tell you a few words, uh, the story, how, how Zalit was introduced. Uh, I'm working at Broadcom as a, as a product owner responsible for uh, Zoe support. And uh, this, uh, with my colleagues, we are like having a lot of uh, calls with customers and solving a lot of their issues. And uh, what we have here, it's just some, some quotes that uh, I collected uh, since Zoe was introduced. Uh, and uh, like, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, like basic questions that uh, we, we believe it's possible to somehow uh, cover and help our customers with, uh, with getting Zoe up and running. Uh, almost two years ago at, at Broadcom, we had a hackathon and uh, we decided to create a tool called, called Zen uh, to help our customers to onboard Zoe uh, as, as quickly as possible. Uh, the statements or, or, the, or the objectives for the tool uh, where and I believe still are uh, in these fours. Uh, we believe that Sysproc uh, should be able to install and configure Zoe uh, with no additional support needed uh, in very, very quick uh, amount of time, uh, in minutes. I, I know it's something fancy, and in real environments, we understand that it's probably not uh, exactly like this, but uh, I think the time from, from downloading the package to running instance can be very easily decreased. And should be. Uh, also, uh, we believe that it should be very easily possible to understand what you need to do to have a Zoe up and running, uh, ideally uh, as a production <coughs> instance. Uh, it might be done easily, you, need, you don't need to write the, the whole documentation, but all the information should be visible and, and available uh, wherever and uh, when time of your needs. Uh, that was the third part of the um, documentation, and the uh, last. Uh, we believe Sysprox shouldn't even write any scripts or any, any type of tool, additional tool, to be able to work uh, with uh, this tool. So uh, what we did, mm, we started with a few uh, like key components or key, key parts, uh, and uh, this is what, what uh, we had for the, for the hackathon. So streamlined uh, installation and configuration process. Uh, we, we would like to uh, allow Zoe users to immediately understand where they are in the installation process, how they are progressing, what they are doing right now. Because from our ex uh, experience, sometimes it's difficult to understand to, uh, to people what they are exactly doing and what is happening under the hood, regardless of any, any tool or, or job, uh, the WD command, whatever. Uh, documentation. Uh, many times uh, we, uh, we heard the feedback that the documentation is nice, but there are a lot of topics, uh, they are overlapping, uh, hypertext links, etc., etc., and we wanted to allow users to have uh, uh, access to documentation in proper time and in proper place of the installation process. Uh, Prerequisite checks, that's one of the, my favorite. Uh, I think Sean already didn't touch it from the, from the YAML perspective, but uh, we would like to take, it, uh, take the topic further and improve it uh, even better. 
uh, when, you are, when you are working with YAML file, uh, you need to know what exactly should be written, uh, and it's your responsibility to, uh, responsibility to uh, put the proper values uh, for variables. What you can do in, in Zen is to validate whether the uh, values that you are putting there are right, uh, are correct. Uh, in this case, uh, for example, the USS uh, location is, is verified. So if you put there something that's not existing on, on the mainframe, it can show you that you are doing something that probably wouldn't work when you would run the installation scripts. Uh, on the fly, variable validation. Uh, that's something that's coming from, from regex. Uh, it's simple to validate whether the value we are putting there makes sense from the like uh, programmatic perspective uh, through uh, regular expressions. Uh, again, this is something that uh, can do the ZWE command, but uh, it would happen uh, when you need, or you, you would need to type the command itself, not in the time when we are filling the variables into the YAML file. So uh, we believe it's possible to do it uh, during the validate during the uh, values uh, inputs. Uh, Zen was built on on uh, like open source framework that uh, has the capability to build uh, to be built on uh, any operating system. It's basically uh, electron framework that uh, it's uh, running, uh, for example, um, VS Code. So uh, same technology would be used for Zen. So you would be able to use uh, Zen on Windows, Linux, uh, macOS. Uh, regardless of your operating uh, system. I have now here a short video. So, uh, what we have here is the Zen version 2, because what, what happened, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we developed Zen uh, almost two years ago. Uh, the Hackathon project happened two years ago, and since that time, Zoe changed a lot. So uh, last two, two years, we were like reworking uh, Zen to allow uh, or to make it compatible with uh, the Zoe V2. Uh, so uh, this is the code that it's already available. I have the link that you can then go and try Zoe, uh, Zen by yourself. And I have here a short video. Uh, one disclaimer, I did the cuts in the video. However, just where the spinner were rotating and it was just about the downloading, uploading, running the scripts, etc. But the like the real work that I needed to uh, to do, uh, it's it is there uh, and it's real. So uh, first, I need to put my credentials to the mainframe. Uh, during the hackathon, we created a connection to the, or we implemented connection to mainframe using FTP. Uh, in the plan, there are additional uh, possibilities. Uh, you can see uh, down below uh, using the Zoe CLI as the like gateway towards the mainframe. So let's uh, let's connect the mainframe to FTG now. Play with credentials. Uh, we see green green mark. It means that uh, the credentials are valid. Uh, under the hood, we are submitting uh, submitting GCL. So we need uh, to know uh, your job card uh, or job statement. But uh, that's I think you need to do it just once, and when it's uh, validated, uh, uh, the processing is continued. By the way, you can see. Uh, we are now in the planning stage, right? So, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, in every step you should know where you are uh, in the installation process. We have here now uh, these six uh, six stages. Probably, uh, proper, probably in the like uh, version one, there would be multiple stages, uh, but, uh, or more stages than these. But uh, this is uh, I think enough for for the technology. Uh, validation of loca locations. Uh, I need to put their variables or the values for the variables, and when I hit the validation, I, I was able to see that all the variables that I put there are, are uh, correct ones. Uh, Java was found, Node.js was found, um, uh, and I have enough space available on the target location. Uh, everything is set, and I can, I can proceed. Uh, further, there will be probably uh, also information about the networking because uh, there are some defaults for it. And if you would like to install uh, install uh, Zoe, you need to have some networking uh, work done, uh, validate security, etc. All these things can be done in one of these stages, maybe in the planning. That's up to discussion. But in general, uh, the validation that I just showed uh, would be uh, applicable and available for any uh, other variables that are needed before the installation can, can happen. It, continue the components installation. Now, 
Uh, what we are seeing here is, uh, I think, a very nice thing that uh, it's not obvious for the first sight, but Chancha uh, mentioned that Zoe has uh, schema files for YAML file. We found, a, uh, we found a library that can take any schema file available and convert it into UI. So this stream is not like hard-coded that we have a variable 1, 2, 3, n, but it's dynamically, uh, semi-dynamically uh, taken from the schema file. So whenever uh, there will be change in the schema file, it means the configuration of Zoe or uh, additional components will change, uh, Zen can uh, almost automatically adapt to that fact and uh, you don't need to do anything else. But still, uh, Zen will be up to date uh, with the latest uh, like version of the uh, YAML slash schema file. So what we have here now is a screen with uh, some, some prefixes. As you can see, uh, there are some, some helps that allows you to uh, edit all the variables uh, at once. And uh, if I would put there something that's not uh, in foreground, as I showed in the previous uh, GIFs, uh, the values would be uh, like validated and if something wrong, uh, you immediately would get a, a notification. I think this is not implemented in the, in the uh, existing uh, version that was available in the previous one, and it's just a, a, about the work that it's need to be moved from one version to, uh, to the next one. So uh, when I am happy with these variables, I can hit uh, the install, uh, install button, uh, and now the stage of installation is, is happening. Uh, here I did a lot of cuts because, in fact, uh, downloading the files took a lot of time and uploading to the mainframe, etc. Uh, basically, what we are doing, we are currently downloading the convenience build locally and then upload it to the mainframe. Uh, what we learned from our customers that many times they don't have direct access from, uh, from mainframe to, to the Zoe page, but uh, this way we are able to uh, distribute, uh, take the Zoe uh, to the mainframe quite, quite easily. Or there will be some changes as well in this page because uh, from, from like legal perspective, you need to uh, ask user to like uh, accept the agreement that's I think coming from, from Linux uh, Foundation. So uh, there will be definitely a lot of changes, but again, the principle will be that you don't need to go anything else. Yeah, uh, you, need, you need just Zen to do at least the basic uh, Zoe installation. Do you know how much I got it? So uh, in fact now uh, I'm faxing the installation file and as you can see the last uh, last row saying uh, run installation script ZWE install. Sean already mentioned that the ZWE should be like the, uh, the worker that does a lot of uh, almost the whole work for Zoe installation. However, Zen can provide some interfaces and uh, validation installation features uh, that uh, will improve the installation process on top of the uh, existing uh, ZOE installed uh, or ZWE installed format of the uh, ZWE. Uh, next two screens will be added, and the reason is that uh, uh, this is something what we agreed on as the next steps. So, uh, as I showed in, uh, I think in the installation planning screens, uh, in the configuration and certificates, you will have the same availability to configure and set the uh, variables. Uh, based on uh, your needs. Uh, we are also planning to uh, implement something like uh, advanced configuration where we would like to show users uh, the real YAML file, but this possibility to validate the file, uh, highlight, the, uh, highlight the structure, etc. Et uh, and uh, the last step would be uh, in initialize the installation. Uh, it will start, start the task. That's not, uh, that's not all about the plans, uh, but uh, in, in general, that's uh, what we are planning to do uh, for the uh, video. So, so the plans and uh, what you can do uh, almost immediately. If you would uh, copy these four commands, you will download uh, uh, Zen from, from uh, Zoe repository, or GitHub, uh, GitHub repository, uh, and uh, you run it uh, from, the, from the source. So you can, you can try uh, Zen uh, today. The next milestone that's planned, um, uh, I think, uh, in less than three months, right? Something like that. 
uh, we would like to, as I mentioned, put the uh, certificate configuration. Uh, we understand that certificates, and Joe will be talking about it uh, a lot uh, in the next minutes, are quite um, very difficult for, for people to understand what is needed, how to validate, and all these things. So we plan to uh, put some, some uh, UI stuff uh, into the Zen that would allow, sim I mean, that would simplify the certificate configuration. Uh, I already mentioned full uh, YAML editing mode. Uh, many customers would like to have a visibility of what's uh, under, uh, under the nice UI, but still have a modern capabilities like uh, code validation, uh, highlights, etc. Validate security definitions. I don't know whether uh, you know or not, but uh, in ZSMN there is a, uh, something that is called like uh, security configuration assistant. And uh, if you would put a special, special XML file into it, uh, uploaded there, uh, it can do the validation of the security definitions that are uh, implemented in that file. It has a nice REST, uh, REST UI, uh, sorry, REST API, and we would like to uh, show this, uh, this tool or present this capability into the Zen. So you will be able to validate and test uh, your security definitions for Zoom. Uh, from our experience, uh, again, it happened many times that someone uh, just made a typo in the, in the definition uh, and uh, it was quite painful to then find whether uh, the character in the in the name is correct or not. Uh, and this is something that would be hard to find, uh, but the security uh, system can help a lot. Uh, I mean, this is your cyber security uh, system. And that's basically the object is for for the current uh, current uh, AI, Louis. Uh, further, we have much more uh, much more uh, ideas, and we will proceed further with the. Uh, the implementation and the improvements of the installation configuration process. And I think now it's time to talk about security and certificates. Um, good morning. Um, yes, so my name is Jeremy Sister, and I work at IBM, but I often tell people that I have the kind of the best job at IBM because I've been paid me, but I kind of work for the Linux Foundation as the Linux Foundation, and I work for all of you, which sounds really corny and cliche. But one of the things I'd like to say, just because we haven't had any interaction yet with the audience, how many folks here are like Cisco folks who install Zoe on a, on, on a zero cell phone? Cool, um, good show of hands. Okay, you're in the right room because we just went from, you know, <laughs> you know we went from like straight to six gear there, so that's phenomenal. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and is that like Zoe version one, Zoe version two? 2.9, good for you, wow. You get a prize, you get a sticker. Um, <laughs> so 2.9, I think, is our latest release. Um, yeah, we didn't really kick off today with a sort of Zoe overview. I'm trying to think, that, so one of the things, sometimes a lot of folks install, we wanted Zoe at the outset. The three things we talked about were open, simple, and familiar. There were three design concepts. I think you were there, Joe, at the start. And we tried to be true to those. And one of the things we wanted to do, because a lot of, sometimes it's very hard for people to get going with mainframe modernization, right? You have to install a, a ton of stuff and get like an assembled kind of SWAT team of like, you know, sysprogs and security admins. And it, it, it's quite hard and often people just give up on that journey. So there's a very successful part of Zoe, uh, which is a plugin for Visual Studio Code. And we have an IntelliJ one now called the Zoe Explorer. And I think this talks. Rose, do we have like an overview slide of the whole landscape of, of the week for Zoe on us? We do. We do? Yes, at the end of this. At session. the end of this one, yes. thanks. I'm sorry for just saying that. I should have looked at these slides before, but they've been, we've been <laughs> fooling around a little bit. Okay, so if, if that's your gig, you're gonna find a lot of really good subject matter experts here. And that's a very great thing to just get rid of Studio Code, get it up and running for a couple of training courses. It has a very basic authentication model, which is your user ID and your password have to be stored and retrieved on your client machine and, and, and flowed every time to you know, zero SMS or FTP or whatever. That's an attack surface. People later will tell you about everything we're trying to do to reduce that attack surface and secure that space. But a lot of shops want to do some, some more advanced things, which is have the ability to disconnect the URL that you're going to with zero SMS, uh, to perhaps go across LPARs, so high availability. Um, you can extend that with lots of APIs for the CLI plugin, and you can then get into more advanced authentication methods, like, you know, like X509 client certificates, um, I think o o OID got added recently, which is where you authenticate to an external provider, multi-factor authentication, and this CRS component 
sits behind that and gives you that, it, you know, the, basically the brains, the lungs, the heart of enhancing that user experience. That's the scenario number one that we see. Number two, this is very gas stuff, which is, um, we got presentations about this week, um, and I think Paul is going to talk at the end about that, which is a really great way to log into the OS for a browser. Um, and that's also the, the kind of backbone behind the, the DB2 administration and the IMS administration funding. Okay, cool. For the folks who installed Zoe, how many folks is this tag? That was set on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Here's everything that I just explained, but it's on a diagram, I should have done this before. Is that like a laser beam? Oh no, that's the other button. Here we go. Sometimes it's like a laser beam. Like, wait. Can you make the text smaller? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thanks, Zoe. This should be a laser beam. Can I make the text smaller, Mr. Gretchen? Um, I'm going to build this up over time. And I, but so that's our very command line interface, which is what I just sort of talked about. You know, doing very jobs, list jobs, listing a bunch of jobs. Uh, you can go into ISPF and you can test the effect of this. And that's it. It's very, very popular. It varies from the CPU. Um, now, by the way, do folks know much about certificates or not? I, no hands got up in the room. Nobody wants to step forward and say, I am a certificate. Joe does, you know, a lot of us <laughs> think it's a Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a kind of certificate primer. It's surprising me, and it's not meant to be a derogatory statement, but how, 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 how little people understand about certificates, <laughs> and how little really experienced CRS sysprogs that I just worship, I have huge amounts of respect for, how little they know about Unix system services. And maybe that's my privilege, my viewpoint. In my 25 years at IBM, I spent the first um, almost 15 or 20 working outside the main room, so I'm quite familiar with this world. So if I say something that freaks you out, or just follow. Okay. Now the ZRS component, once it's installed, on how the, by the way, has anybody in this room configured to your SMS? Or no? You had to up. Okay. So for you to be able to connect, the ZRS MS has a user interface, it has, um, you know, multiple technologies, you can log into the browser, you know, you can type in your URL, you know, four, I think 443 is the default one slash and log in. What your browser will do is your SMS presents a certificate to your browser. And Zoe CLI and Zoe um, Explorer, and Zoe Google Studio Code or Intelligent, they need to be able to do that. So the data has to be encrypted. So that's what sort of TLS or transform by security. And if you log into a browser, you're gonna see, you're gonna see HTTPS. And the S means I'm secure. If you don't see the S and you just see HTTP, it's not secure. And when it's not secure, everything that flows back and forth between here, anybody can snark it. Okay, so a bad actor could sit in the middle here and look at packets of data going forward, and you have an attack surface because they could retrieve out of their uh, information coming back that perhaps you didn't want them to see, you know, some sensitive information, especially if you work in healthcare or whatever. You have PI personal data, and you can be fined and hunted down by you know, large institutions that make your life difficult. Um, and also, every time you authenticate, every time you do what's called a REST API, your user ID and your password and the most basic authentication are going to be flowed down on the HTTP header. And on HTTP header, that's going to be in the clear. Okay? So somebody could hit you, they could attack you, they could read it out, they could read out the IBM user if you wanted, or PSP or Adam. They could log in elsewhere, they could upload their privileges, bad things could happen. Okay? And again, there's lots of talks to share about that, I'm not the expert, I have it. Mark Wilson and Jason Vitali, and there's lots of people who can tell you that's secure. Okay. So you're going to create a certificate for zero SMS, you're going to make HTTPS in. That certificate is going to be like to be held in a key ring, that, that TV key ring. And when you do that, that certificate is going to be presented. I'm going to talk a little bit about the common things we have. One of the things that's quite important is the defaults we have for Zoe is that the certificate must be a fully, must be, we make it the most rigid it can be, which is that it has to be fully trusted. If I just log into browsers here, and the browser says, I didn't like where you're going, right? And it comes out, I accept, I add a challenge. Then the browser will ask you strange questions. It doesn't just go flying in. And even once you take the exception, normally the little red, there's like a warning, you know, as you're, as, you know, as you're flying, it's kind of like a warning light on the screen. I don't trust it, but we'll cover some of those scenarios. If you ever come across this, there's a parameter called reject unauthorized calls, which is to overwrite. Okay. Does any of this make sense? Okay. Now, with all of our ZOE ZOS components that 
Jordan now did a really good job at. We start a number of, I guess, microservices. And these microservices are, um, they, they perform various functions. And these microservices need to communicate with each other and they're running under Unix system services. Okay? And I'm going to see if I can do some more stuff. We got some animations. Ooh, cool. I have some animations. Now, for these microservices, so we've got very client communicating to the OS. <coughs> with these microservices communicating to each other on a ZOS LPAR running under Unix system services, they also translate on the that they also talk to each other on the TLS, okay? So you've got the kind of client-server posture, but then these need to talk to each other. So the ZOE certificate, there's, um, you can pick a one certificate for ZOE, it has to be used for this to be able to talk to this, to establish the TLS connection, <coughs> okay? But unlike this, which is only a server-side certificate, because you're getting people talking to a client, so, you know, on a, on a laptop or a CITP server, <coughs> This, the TLS certificate, so I'm thinking of an example I can do. So the Zoe desktop runs in a browser, and the Zoe desktop will talk to um, sort of the API discovery layer. The Zoe desktop will talk to it as a server from the API discovery layer, because it tries to establish a handshake to it, but it's also a client as well. So people are familiar with client certificates. The Zoe certificate takes the posture of being a server certificate and a client certificate. And that sometimes freaks people out, right? Because a lot of people doing ZOS administration are very familiar with configuring a server side certificate. And the reason it's a client certificate is because we have an attack surface, which is that these things communicate to each other, they do some very privileged things to bring up Zoe. You have a possible attack surface where somebody can take one of these out and put a rogue actor in that kind of topology of that microservices. <coughs> so these have to be able to handshake to each other to, to generate sort of provenance and fidelity of those services. Any questions on that? That would be all good. Okay. Um, by the way, when I run out of time, I, I have a habit of just talking forever. Just literally like pull the chain on me. Okay, and there's another handshake that occurs and Sean and Joe know more about. We have also have a cross-memory communication as well. So no, sorry, that's TLS, and then we have another server called the CIS server where things are cross-memory. That's not okay. And our certificate now, the certificate that Zoe has can either be held in a USS key store or a SAP DB for SAP database, okay? Those are the two types of certificates that we see. Do people know the difference between, how many people know what a PKCS graph certificate is? Oh, surprising numbers, cool. Well done. David, well done, sir. Just to know what a PKCS graph certificate is, thank you. Um, so, uh, you can have a certificate itself which contains information like public keys, private keys, a bunch of things like that. Um, on the sort of a laptop, that will be held in a .key file, or a .serve file, or a .pen file. And then a key store um, is gonna, the prefix is normally used in .key 12. I don't know much, is there like a .key 11? I don't know the provenance of that anyway, or the .key 12. So when you see a .key 12, so for folks who don't know about, so most folks are familiar with a certificate if you're a DOS, DOS system programmer, like you do a rack key search, like list, ID, you can search and search for some key rings. The key ring is the thing that holds them all together, creates your chain of signing authority, and it's owned by a particular user ID, so if you have privileges to that user ID, you can access that key ring. And in the SAP DB, it's got bats that which then holds it. Okay. So those, those two analogies are the, the USS, you know, the key files and the key stores. And it's making sense. And once you've got all of these bad boys configured and up and running, um, the way that we prefer you to then continue working with Zoe is that rather than having your client just basically connecting to ZOSMS, which is one on one single endpoint, user ID and password have to be stored in some uh, you know, semi secure way that's still attack surface, you can go through the API gateway, which gives you high availability, multi factor authentication, and lots of much more secure things. Especially if perhaps the, the laptop running this is in the public cloud and you really don't want the user ID and password to be there, there's lots of ways that we can store you know, uh, you know, other, other tokens in there that can be used. And you can come down to here and flip it out, associated with the TSA user ID, and then go southbound. You guys are with me or? I should have brought a coffee cup in the front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, as 
Sean and Jan were saying before. Um, the way that you configure the kind of mother of all um, Zoe files to configure is the Zoe.yaml file. Um, so he was the first thing said that they configured 2.9. Somebody said it there. When you configure, one of the things that's very difficult to do is so these are screenshots of the file and it's all prettified and colored, and that's because I'm actually using the Visual Studio Code plugin in the Zoe Explorer to edit it. And because the Visual Studio Code plugin comes with this distributed world, you know, all the sort of PC boys and girls, it can just eat YAML for breakfast. When you go into ISDF 3.4 or 3.17 or something, it's just a bunch of green and black. You're PFDing, you're, you're out of the wazoo. It's very likely that you're going to, you know, you can't spot a comment and a non comment, so you can't see the you have these beautiful alignment things, you're going to make a mistake. Can I also mention the um, VS Code screen and, and the most interesting YAML thing in VS Code is just the YAML plugin. I think it's made by Red Hat, also free. Works totally offline because if you, if you go to like yamlvalidator.com or whatever, you don't know where that information is going. So you can run all this offline and if there's a syntax error, it will actually highlight on what line it is. So it's, it's way better than when I asked you have error checking here. So I highly recommend using it both for free and then just other ways to do it. It is, yeah. I know some customers who tell me they can't use it, they've got locked down desktops, blah, blah, blah. It's actually very important. They, there's actually a port of BIM to use system services to get all that. Just going to speed up a little bit. So there we've got certificate dot keystore pipe. And I've smooshed all these together. That's not a real word, smooshed, anyway. Um, but I've, obviously, there's lots of um, you know, other bits of those, but the, the Zoe is like a dot syntax. That's the bit, that's the magic that says when all these microservices power up, where is the Zoe certificate? Zoe certificate dot keystore type. Um, but it only gets a keystore type. And we have certificate keystore type PKCS12. We point to the path for the keystore, the password, the keystore has a password. And the alias, which is basically the, it's not the name of the certificate, because the certificate have a different name, but when you import it, it's the name we're going to read it. So it's like the label of the key ring. Or, so it's certificate key store, and then we have this strange syntax that got kind of invented afterwards, and it's not path, it's not forward slash for unit path, it's like the word sat key ring, kernel, four slashes, I think you can have two slashes now. The user ID is the own sat key ring, and then the name of the key ring. And then the label of the people and the personal certificate and stuff. Okay? We good for that? If you get those wrong and, and, and it's just all going to go south. Okay, so that's very important. And we get very, two quick examples. I'm just maybe just like hit the gas a little bit. Is that right? Hit the gas pedal. I'm in the US. Like, we call it an accelerator in the US. Um, so, so folks get confused, and I still get confused about that. So if you really know what you're doing, you can bypass Zoe in a certificate. Okay. If you really understand certificate management, you go straight into Zoe.certificate.keystore type. You've got your own certificate. Maybe somebody gave it to you, provisioned it for you, and you just point it with a path, power up Zoe, and you're off to the races. Okay? I really suggest now, unfortunately our documentation is a little bit wrong because our documentation kind of goes straight into saying, well, create a certificate for you. And a lot of people don't want to create a certificate from scratch. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to get right. To say, I'm going to create a certificate that's fully trusted, you know, and, and, and fully valid for all my subject alternate names. You're much better to import. And there's only in it certificate can, um, we provide default templates. And these are the, so Zoe, in the section called Zoe, that set up certificate, which is indented. It, you know, it's not Zoe's certificate, it's Zoe's set up certificate. We provide five scenarios in our YAML, default YAML file for what is it you're likely to do. And the two most common ones that I see just is you already have an existing certificate and a key ring. It's probably the same one that DOSMF is using. It's, being, it's from a certificate authority that likely your browser clients already trust. Just make sure we use that. Right? Please, that should be your opening gambit. Right? If everything fails, for whatever reason, we, you can create a PKCS 12 certificate in Unix System Services and use that. It's going to be self-signed, it's going to be untrusted, you know, you can, um, but that's really any kind of proof of concept MVP stuff if you can't talk to your security department to get the key to certificate. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Cool.
How much time do I have, by the way? Wait, wait. What? Five minutes. But you said there were slides at the end about. Yes. <laughs> Four <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and now it's three. <laughs> I've got into, I've got into uh, a colleague of mine, actually, uh, Sam, wrote a very good blog. If, if you're a Zoe user, there's a really, we have good Zoe documentation, but if you go to Zoe.org and scroll down, we have some, there's a blog site called medium.com slash Zoe. You can always see our latest three ones, and you can just go there and read a ton of phenomenal information. And Sam and I actually kind of worked together to write this because Sam was shadowing me and she was just on so many customer calls where I was explaining to them how to do this and she was literally taking notes by the background. She's like, hey Joe, I think this is it. I've written a blog. I'm like, I love you. This is too good at this. <laughs> but here's the, here's the thing. So, now just because I'm being a bit fancy pants and it's a bit early in the morning, I'm doing Zoe TSO issue command because that's a command to issue it from the client. I could have just logged into um, you know, TSO and just taken off the thing. The rack teaser, list key ring, I did use key ring, I did use distal, I did use user. That will tell me details for the GMS and certificate. On my out part, <laughs> that I use this example, that's my label, my cert, and that's my label for my certificate of service. It's not going to be that in your shop, right? You're probably going to have an intermediate, you're probably going to have a group, different labels, but once you've got that, at least you can begin, start going, what are you doing now? Okay. Um, and that's just the, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have screen for this. I'm really sorry, I had brought on actually CS2 and top secret, and this is rack and I'm not pushing rack when I'm group managers. Yeah, they're slightly different formats, but so we have the needs the information yeah. that I right? Get that information, right? Talk to a friend, raise a top ticket, get that information. And if you have multiple circles, write them down. It's important that you know the whole chain of certificate authority. Now, when we go into zoe.setup certificate, the section called scenario four, and you, you start to configure this. You don't need to do this, by the way, but I'll show you what happens when you do it. Because we still need to create, so Zoe can't use the certificate by ZOSMS. Zoe can't use the key ring that by ZOSMS is pointing to the SAPDB certificate. Zoe still needs to create its own key ring that then connects to the certificate and connects to the circle. You go through that thing, because we're running into different user ID. Okay, so, you, what you do is you specify the Zoe.yaml, the keyring name of the keyring that we're going to create, so we keyring stuff for that. The owner of the existing keyring, which in our case is <coughs> IDIT USBR, that's the dot one. The so label that we saw earlier. And the certificate authorities, and this is interesting as well. Um, I think in our default they're all in one line, but to understand YAML syntax, what well, hasn't took up over this. If you have like an intermediate and a root, have two intermediates and a root, they all need to be here with that way. Let's go back one. We've got minus statement and the name certificate. So <coughs> you miss one out, it's going to go back. It, it, you know, you, it just bad things will happen. Okay, you're, you're not going to get the proper trust. Thank you. Okay, and I've got a little example of that. Like, I'll show an intermediate. I can make this one that whole big group. That's what people tend to do. You might have two or three or four. There's loads of them in it, or they might have checked the information group. And then when you're in Zoe, you can use the ZWE command, which Jan and Sean talked about. You go ZWE init certificate, you can't see it up. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> ZWE, I need a laser beam on this. I'm sure there's a laser beam. Okay, the last button. There you go. Two minutes, Joe. I'm the new Star Wars back to the room. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. Like, if you push your lightsaber and it comes out red, it means your life is a sin. Okay, two minutes. Thank you, Joe. ZWE init certificate. By the way, these are all up there. And the thing that I always like to do is I can dash dash security to I run. What it does is it creates a piece of JCL for you that you can then look at later. If you don't do security to I run, it submits it for you. You're going to get a bunch of errors in your syslog. And I've literally been on calls with customers where they don't do that. And literally, what, two minutes later, like the, somebody else in their company, like, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm just getting bugged by my, you know, I've got all these. Syslog exceptions, you know, because somebody's like, what are you doing? You're faking all these certs. So just be careful um, about doing it without that. I've got a little video, I'm just going to speed up. Um, when we submit it, I'll just read the list. Like, what I wanted to show you is we create the JCL, and you can look at it, and it's split up nicely. You can see MACD cert, add ring, Zoe keyring, that's going to create it. 
the one security driver, get them with commands, and then one by one step them through, because it might be that in your environment somebody else with more privileges can run them, or you need to negotiate with somebody, the naming conventions aren't quite right. And then, hurry up now. And then don't forget, once you generate a certificate, you have to update the preserving certificate as well, and obviously do a copy paste to split our default. And I think there is a way that it, it does it automatically, but I never, I, I didn't even know if that bit was part of it. I don't think the driver, no. I don't think the driver. Very well. Okay. <coughs> Rose, do you want to yank the chain on me? So I just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He finishes because he's winding up. Is it me? It's you. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm keeping you too long. There's another one for the PKCS 12. Um, Look at these in your ledger. I hate saying that to people, because people never look at recordings of meetings and stuff, but there's all of good information. Um, and then that's the thing I was talking about, not secure. This particular certificate um, happens to be not secure. You can see it's the one that I use, like the self and and stuff. We'll talk about that later. That's my certificate as well. Where's our end slide? With session. There you go. Here we are. Bruce, you want to talk to this? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Thanks, yeah. Joe. So this was this is Zoe Day Part One. Jan, Sean, Joe, thank you guys for leading us through that with the, the tips for continuing and what have you. We're following up with Zoe Day Part Two, where we're going to talk about new features in V2, what's coming in V3, um, Part Three and Four this afternoon, where we're going to go a, a deeper dive into Zoe's zero trust architecture. Uh, and tips for configuring Zoe security in general. And then we'll wrap it up with, we've got special guests. We have some of our extenders here today, BMC, Phoenix Software, and Segus. They're gonna be showcasing their apps that they built on Zoe, that's session four later today. Um, jumping ahead till Wednesday, we have a roadmap session. If you were interested in Zen, for example, and you want to encourage the Zoe community to move faster or move further, move deeper on Zen or anything else related to what you're doing with Zoe, please attend that session. It's, it's going to be interactive. This is all about the community listening to what you're doing with Zoe and how we can help to improve and further your initiatives as it relates to Zoe. Um, plenty of other sessions throughout the week. Um, of course, we want you to attend all of them. Um, and uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, please um, fill out the little raffle ticket that we gave you. I've got a box in a box. Um, so put your raffle ticket in here. Every time you attend a Zoe session, uh, you can enter. And we have 50 Yeti mugs to give away. So very likely that you'll, you'll win one and you'll be the envy of everyone in your workplace. <laughs> Alrighty, um, one more thing we wanted to mention. We are partnering with Interskill. Uh, Interskill um, does a great deal of mainframe training. They have a Zoe Foundations course. I believe at this point in time it is free to take. We highly encourage you to take that course. We will be producing more courses. We focused in on config for a reason. We know that a lot of you are struggling with this for many reasons. And so we're going to see if we can uh, produce some training material related to configuring, administering, and troubleshooting uh, Zoe, particularly the ZOS components. So give that a try, and as always, please evaluate our session. Uh, we look to improve them year over year. This is the reason why we did not start with what is Zoe today, because we had feedback last time that said, we know what Zoe is. We want, we want a deeper dive on the technical details, and so that's what we brought to you today. So please do take a minute to fill those out, and with that, Thank you, guys. Great session. Thank you. Thank you.